Well, uh, as we mentioned going into the broadcast, uh, if uh, unless you've been uh, under a rock, I think, uh, you are probably aware of the fact that uh, the Supreme Court uh, has uh, handed down a, a number of uh, very uh, impactful uh, decisions that it has made. Uh, they've released the findings uh, this uh, particular week. But boy, uh, if you thought, uh, for instance, uh, the concealed carry uh, upholding uh, uh, decision that happened yesterday uh, was uh, going to stir things up, uh, you were uh, definitely underselling what was going to happen today. Mm -hmm. uh, interesting headline uh, on the PJ Media news site. It says, Victory, Supreme Court overturns Roe v. Wade. Casey with Dobbs decision. Uh, they go on to say this. Uh, this Friday, this morning, the Supreme Court handed down its decision in the much anticipated Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization case, overturning the pro abortion precedent set by Roe versus Wade and the Casey decision. Uh, according to Justice Samuel Alito, who wrote for a 6 3 majority in the Supreme Court, we are told the Constitution does not confer a right to abortion. Roe and Casey are overruled, and the authority to regulate abortion is returned to the people and their elected representatives. It is time to heed the Constitution and return the issue of abortion to the people's elected representatives. Alito was joined in the majority opinion by Justice Thomas, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Barrett. Uh, I should say, to be precise here, uh, Judge John Roberts filed a separate opinion concurring with the majority. Uh, again, writing for the minority uh, in the opinion, Justices Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan uh, dissented by saying, with sorrow for this court, but more for the many millions of American women who have today lost a fundamental constitutional protection, we dissent. Uh, the essence of this decision is going to return the issue of abortion to individual states to regulate as each sees fit. Uh, those that are dark blue states are expected to impose uh, the most radical pro-abortion policies, and they have the wherewithal to be able to do that, while dark red states may very well ban all abortion. Many states may choose to allow abortion only under certain circumstances. Uh, for your information to bring you up to speed on this, the Dobbs case concerns a Mississippi law that made abortion illegal after the first 15 weeks of pregnancy. The Supreme Court heard arguments in the case in November of 2021. The decision was originally expected to be handed down in June, but an unprecedented act uh, of, uh, of uh, I, I guess for lack of a term, subversion, uh, someone leaked an early draft of the majority opinion. Uh, the new site Politico published the leaked draft on May 2nd that uh, certainly caused uproar among abortion supporters uh, to the level where protests uh, were held outside the homes of Supreme Court justices. And in one case, uh, in the case of Judge John Kavanaugh, an individual made the trip from California with the intent of assassinating uh, Justice Kavanaugh and uh, had the uh, arms and the uh, well with the wherewithal to be able to do that. He was intercepted and not able to attack uh, Justice Kavanaugh. Uh, again, uh, we are told, according to uh, polls, uh, only a third or so of Americans support abortion in the second trimester. Only 19 percent think it's okay in the third trimester. However, some states, such as Oregon, New Jersey, New York, California, and others, allow abortion up until birth. Uh, and over half of U.S. states permit the procedure well after a baby is viable. Uh, Roe versus Wade uh, in its decision, forced the entire country to permit abortion of pre-viable babies and freed individual states to permit the act throughout pregnancy. So, you know, what Roe v. Wade uh, really did was took the right to regulate abortion away from the states. It enshrined it as a constitutional right. It uh, said it was a uh, penumbra, to use the court's language, of uh, the right to privacy, which is not enumerated, by the way, in the Supreme Court, but was an offshoot of uh, the 14th Amendment of uh, the Constitution, which granted uh, full citizenship to uh, slaves. And uh, so uh, very interesting twisted legal reasoning involved with all that. Uh, even justices like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, 
uh, looked at Roe versus Wade as a flawed decision because although being very much uh, in favor of abortion, Ruth Bader Ginsburg felt that uh, the decision of Roe versus Wade was exceedingly broad. It was an overreach. It would really not stand up under a strict constitutional uh, evaluation and would set the stage for what we've seen here today. Uh, the Supreme Court has essentially said that there is no constitutionally guaranteed right to abortion. But having said that, what it does is it returns the right to individual states to make up their own minds about what their policy on regulating abortion is going to be. And so you're going to have states like California, New York, Oregon, Washington that are going to have uh, radically uh, altered uh, state uh, policies regarding abortion even up to and in some cases, uh, for instance, the California law even could be interpreted to allowing a child to die after birth under the uh, penumbra of abortion. Mm. Uh, in Arizona, uh, where we live, uh, there are a number of them that would go back to pre-Roe uh, policies that they had within, within the state. In other words, the state of Arizona never rescinded its previous policy about abortion, but because of Roe versus Wade, this policy was set aside and deemed unenforceable by the Supreme Court. So uh, Arizona is going to go back uh, to a very uh, strong uh, uh, pro-life position. Uh, Doug Ducey, our governor, has uh, issued a statement uh, saying that that would be what the state will go ahead and do. And uh, apparently uh, 24 states are going to uh, outlaw abortion uh, and uh, four states, I should say, greatly restrict abortion. Mm. Uh, and uh, four states are going to outlaw it altogether. Mm. Uh, so you can take a look online to see which individual states you live in, what their policies are going to be regarding the practice of abortion. So having said uh, all of that, the big question that comes up obviously is what is a biblical point of view mm. on the whole subject of abortion on being pro-life versus pro-choice well if you've been with us on the program for any length of time we've answered this question on a number of different occasions and and what i really believe uh, dave is that there is one fundamental question that every believer in christ needs to wrestle with now especially that roe versus wade has been overturned and the question is this when does life begin? Right. That is the fundamental question. Now, there's no doubt about the fact that God is the giver of life, but we could ask this question. Is, you know, a, a uh, fertilized egg just a clump of cells? Hmm. Uh, is it, uh, you know, some people, uh, some uh, states will have heartbeat laws and say once a heartbeat is detected, uh, then uh, they would want to uh, ban abortion at that point. Uh, others would say, well, you know, uh, until the, uh, the fetus, as they would say, is uh, old enough to feel pain, uh, then uh, th there could be certain protections involved. And some, as we've seen on the more radical side, would say that there is some moral alchemy that takes place when a baby passes through a birth canal, mm -hmm. that uh, after that process is completed, that is now a human being with full rights. Prior to that time, all bets are off. Mm -hmm. So what should our point of view be on this particular question? Well, the first thing that we have to get under our belt is this. You know, I've had this conversation with some of my pro-choice friends, and they will inevitably say that nobody knows when life begins, that it's an unanswerable question. Well, actually, it is an answerable question, and you don't have to be a Bible-believing Christian to come to a conclusion on this. It is a scientifically answerable question, a logically answerable question in this regard. Uh, when you have a fertilized egg, when a female egg cell joins with a male sperm, uh, what do you have there? You do not have scientifically, biologically, an inanimate object. Mm. You have a being, uh, something that is living. No scientist will tell you that that fertilized egg is not uh, a living being of some kind. In fact, we can even take it a step further we can, by analyzing the DNA of that uh, fertilized egg, and determine what kind of a being it is. Uh, every fertilized egg has 46 chromosomes, the genetic blueprint 
that makes us human. In fact, all of the data, all the information necessary to make us us is contained right there in that individual at a moment of birth. Mm. So scientifically and logically, at that moment of birth, we have a being, we have a being that is human. It, no matter how much time or effort or energy you put into this, that fertilized egg is never going to become a rhinoceros. It's never going to become a giraffe. It's never going to become a bat. Mm. It is always, always, always going to become a human being. It is a being that is human. It is a human being. And, and so scientifically, we can know when life begins. We can trace it back to the moment of conception. Scripturally, we can also know where life begins. And this is really where we as believers in Christ uh, need to, to take our stand uh, on this. Uh, in Psalm 139, King David made a very interesting statement about uh, God's involvement in his life from the very beginning. In verse 13 of Psalm 139, David wrote this, For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And in your book, they were all written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. Now, that, that phrase, uh, you know, you saw me when I was, my essence, when I was yet unformed. Really, that comes back to that moment of conception. You see, after the moment of conception, a miracle takes place. Scientists call it cell differentiation. You come from one cell, one single cell, and suddenly, because of the genetic blueprint, because of the DNA that it, God has hardwired into that cell, suddenly you have the cell begin to divide, and suddenly the cells begin to follow certain blueprints that have been laid out. Some cells uh, will become, uh, say, brain tissue. Other cells will become skin. Other cells will become kidneys or the liver. Others will become fingernails. Uh, even the, the color of our eyes mm -hmm. is, is determined at that particular time. And so what David is saying is from that moment of conception before the first cell divided, before cell differentiation took place, the unformed substance, God looked upon that and didn't say it. It didn't say, well, who knows? He looked in David's case and said, there is King David. Mm. And God said the same thing about you and about me. Uh, another fascinating insight into all of this takes place in the book of Luke, chapter 1. Uh, we see uh, a very interesting insight into the nature of preborn life, actually having a spiritual dimension. Mm -hmm. We are told in uh, Luke, chapter 1, and verse 26, Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee and again announced the birth of Christ. We are told that Mary, after this announcement, arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste to a city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened that as Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, Elizabeth was the mother of in utero John the Baptist at this point. We are told that the baby in utero John the Baptist, when Mary, who was in the first trimester, comes on the scene, this baby in the womb leapt and Elizabeth, as a result, was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she spoke with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is it granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Now listen to this. For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Mm -hmm. Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her of the Lord. Now notice, as soon as Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, we are told that a separate human being, John the Baptist in utero, heard that greeting, and we are told had an emotional, dare I say, spiritual response, mm -hmm. leapt for joy within her womb. So we're not only told that uh, John the Baptist in utero was a separate person from Elizabeth, we are told that John the Baptist in utero was capable of experiencing emotions, mm -hmm. uh, leapt for joy, and in fact was capable of having a spiritual experience, being able to leap for joy. Why? Because Messiah had come into his presence. Mm. Wow. So 
from a scriptural point of view, and we can go into a number of other verses that talk about how, you know, again, God has plans for our lives before you know, even there was a day uh, that was involved with it, that God uh, writes all of the days of our lives in a book and so on. We, we could cover all these things, but suffice it to say, from a scriptural point of view, uh, there really is no way around the fact that we as Bible-believing Christians are left with no alternative but to see that God is pro-life from the very first moment. Now, again, this really comes down to uh, a debate that sometimes we have with non-believers, and uh, uh, the, the people that I've talked to have been uh, pro-choice, have been those that you know are pretty iffy about a relationship with God. And they'll say, well, you know, that's, that's just your Bible, and, and well, you know, the scientific stuff, you know, and so on. You know, it really, it, it, it becomes quite personal at that point. I try to make it as personal as I can. I said, okay, I have one question to ask of you. Uh, the only difference between you and me and a fertilized egg is time and nurture. Mm. That's it. So I would ask you, what, when did your life begin? Actually, there's no way around it. Uh, God saw us from the time we were a fertilized egg to this particular point. And so we as believers in Christ, you know, I, 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 I always say this, and I don't mean to make it sound like a disclaimer. We try not to be very political on this program because we're here to share the principles of God's Word. And that's what we do at Calvary Christian Fellowship of Tucson. Now, obviously, the more we are informed about what the biblical principles are all about, what God's priorities are all about, that's going to inform our decisions politically. Uh, you know, I don't endorse candidates uh, from the pulpit. Uh, you know, I, I don't believe that's my job. If I do take a stand along this line, I learned this from Pastor Chuck Smith, uh, you know, I've lost half my audience. They're not going to listen to me about the gospel because suddenly the issue is politics and not who Jesus is and not what a relationship with him is all about. But having said that, there are two issues that I feel uh, every Bible-believing pastor and every Bible-believing Christian needs to stand for. Number one is being pro-life. I, I don't see any other way around it. I don't see any way of saying, well, it's an individual choice and we can agree to disagree. No, you really can't because, uh, again, God uh, lays down that particular standard for us. You know, in the book of Matthew, chapter 19, you want to see what God's attitude is towards uh, children. In Matthew, chapter 19, we are told this, uh, that in verse 13, Then little children were brought to Jesus that he might put his hands on them and pray. But the disciples rebuked them. <laughs> you know, in other words, they thought, oh, the master's too important to be dealing with children. But Jesus said, Let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of, of heaven. And he laid his hands on there and departed from there. In, in the parallel account of the uh, book of Mark, we're told that when Jesus saw that the disciples were shooing parents away, uh, literally he became indignant. Uh, the word in the original language means to snort like an angry horse. Mm. You know, if you want to see Jesus get fired up, get between him and children. Mm. We're also told in the parallel account in the book of Luke, that he took the children up individually in his arms and blessed them. That meant that they were little infants. Uh, you know, some people say, well, you know, I, I, I don't think that life really begins until a child is viable. Well, infants aren't viable. You leave an infant to itself, it's not going to last very long. Mm -hmm. I know some teenagers that aren't viable. <laughs> you know, if you leave them to themselves, they're not going to last very long. A few long. adults, too. Yeah. But, uh, but the, the, the bottom line is this. God loves children. And because God loves children, Satan obviously hates them. The, the mm. picture of innocence, the, uh, the picture uh, of being fearfully and wonderfully made, uh, the uh, opportunity to cut them off before they can make an impact for the glory of God mm. in this world. Uh, over 60 million abortions in this country since Roe versus Wade became the law of the land. Wow. So, you know, it, it's interesting. Uh, earlier this uh, week on Monday, there was a celebration of Juneteenth where we commemorated uh, when the final slaves in Texas got the news that uh, the Emancipation Proclamation had been made and the uh, 14th Amendment of the United States, or to the United States Constitution had been passed and that they were, they were freed. And uh, as, you know, it was a, a wonderful moment and it should be commemorated. Uh, but uh, my, my brother uh, on the internet uh, said, why shouldn't this day, June 24th, uh, be uh, celebrated? Uh, because uh, on this day, preborn individuals uh, were given the right to life. Uh, 
Mm. Uh, we're not even talking about liberty and the pursuit of happiness. If you don't have the right to life, the rest is a non-starter anyway. Right. So very important for us to understand that, very important for us to be able to give a reasoned answer to people who ask us uh, for uh, these questions. And the other practical side of it is this. You know, I, I've noticed uh, just being on social media today, uh, there have been an, uh, a number of uh, people, even on the Christian side of things, who've said, well, you know, okay, you know, so uh, Roe versus Wade has been set aside, uh, you know, so what? You know, what do we do now? Well, here's what you do now. If you really want to be pro-life in the best sense of the term, can I encourage you, don't sit on the sidelines on this particular issue. We need to come alongside individuals that are facing these kind of decisions mm -hmm. and offer them the kind of support, the kind of nurture, the kind of care uh, that uh, people need to, uh, again, face what could be one of the greatest challenges of their lives, mm -hmm. that is bringing a child into this world. We need to allow them to know that you know, there are other alternatives aside from abortion, that is adoption. Uh, we need to encourage them that they can uh, keep their, their children. You know, back when we uh, did a, a Reason for Hope on radio, when this subject came up, I was really taken aback that day because we had three different women call a program who said that they were considering an abortion mm. uh, because they had been sexually assaulted, mm. but they decided to keep their child. Wow. And now, you know, and they offer these tales, of the, these stories about uh, how this child that they brought into the world is now the light of their life, wow. that they couldn't imagine life without them. Mm. Uh, one of them is sharing about how their baby just graduated from college and, mm. and, and so on. So there are alternatives, even in the most extreme circumstances. So here's how you can uh, make a practical difference. There are crisis pregnancy centers across the country. Maybe you've heard that uh, in the aftermath of the leaking of uh, the decision that was made today, the Dobbs decision, uh, that a number of these uh, crisis pregnancy centers have been either defaced or actually uh, attempted to be burned down across the country. Forty such incidents already. And boy, you better believe there's some angry people out there uh, that uh, are, are very upset that now states and elected representatives are now going to be given the opportunity to be able to set this kind of policy. So uh, very important that we come alongside and encourage those who are making a difference in this area. Now, there's a couple of different uh, uh, community service organizations here in Tucson that do offer solidly biblical support and counsel and, uh, and resources to those that are facing these kind of decisions. Uh, one of them, uh, and we just got some wonderful friends involved with this ministry, is called Hands of Hope here in Tucson. If you want to find out more about that, how to volunteer, uh, if you don't have time to volunteer, how you can financially support just an incredibly valid ministry, uh, their website is handsofhopetucson.com. Maybe we can put that up uh, on the, the website uh, for, and for people to yeah. uh, be able to link to along this line. There is another ministry here in town that also uh, does the same wonderful work. Uh, it is called Answers for Life. And it's, their uh, website is found at uh, AFLT, AFL Tucson, I should say, AFLTucson.com. And uh, there are also great opportunities to get involved with that ministry. Uh, there are ways to give that are located at both of uh, these websites. And if you know somebody who's dealing with an unplanned pregnancy and wondering what to do next, these are great resources to steer them to uh, because they're going to get uh, sonograms, they're going to get, uh, uh, again, uh, free ultrasounds, uh, that they have medical staff and life resources that can help people in a very practical way uh, make the best kind of choice, to say yes to life, if you will, mm. in the best and fullest sense of the term. So uh, Answers for Life and, uh, again, Hands of Hope here in Tucson. Uh, if you're outside of Tucson, uh, just do a, a search on the internet for crisis pregnancy centers uh, and uh, abortion alternative centers in your community and uh, come alongside them. Uh, mm -hmm. Support them financially if you uh, feel so led to really make a decision. Volunteer some of your time. It's going to be something that the Lord's definitely going to smile upon. Mm. So, Yeah. Monica commented, uh, Jeremiah 1-4, uh, yeah. I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb, before you were born. I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. And 
something you said really struck me was just the purpose, you know, because because no doubt we you know don't want to sidestep that there are complicated, difficult reasons to pursue you know abortion. You mentioned sexual assault and the like. You know, we don't want to minimize that. That's obviously a complicated decision to make, but. It struck me afresh that to know that if God is the giver of life, he's also the giver of, of purpose, you know, in those in those lives. And yeah. as you shared, to know that even if a, a child came from a, um, you know, a, a terrible circumstance, there can be great purpose for that life because God has given that life. And I think that's incredibly encouraging. Yeah, interesting uh, question from uh, Craig on uh, our Facebook uh, page here. And, and Craig, I'll, I'll share this uh, because I think it, it's really relevant to where a lot of people are at. He said, all that was just said makes so much sense. I'm questioning my anger towards those who are being violent towards the overturned mm-hmm. decision on abortion. Is this a case where my anger is righteous? Well, Craig, there's a difference between being uh, righteously angry over an issue and unrighteously angry towards people who perhaps are, well, uh, deceived on a particular issue. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I think about the account of Ananias, a man who lived in Damascus. Uh, You know, the Apostle Paul, uh, before he was Paul, uh, was the Rabbi Saul, and he literally breathed every breath he took uh, was dedicated to exterminating uh, what he called, what he felt was a, a horrible, deceptive cult uh, mm-hmm. in, in incipient Christianity. Well, he was not just content uh, to uh, persecute and even uh, oversee the deaths of uh, believers in Jerusalem. He was given letters from the high priest and was heading to Damascus when the Lord intercepted him. Uh, you're probably familiar with the Damascus Road experience where suddenly uh, there was a light brighter than the sun. Uh, Saul fell from his horse and a voice came saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he says, who are you, Lord? He goes, I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. In fact, Jesus said in that encounter, it is hard for you to kick against the goats. It's such a vivid picture because uh, when a person would be using an ox to plow uh, to uh, keep an ox from kicking or, or uh, continued, continuing to obey the commands of those uh, plowing the ox, they would have little spikes uh, that would be attached. And if uh, an ox would kick, they would, again, encounter that spike and mm-hmm. the pain would keep that ox in line. Well, what God was saying about uh, Saul at that point was he was kicking against the goads. Mm-hmm. Remember, Saul's campaign of terror against Christians came after he had heard Stephen give the gospel account. Uh, In fact, uh, Stephen had uh, pretty much put Rabbi Saul down in open debate. And, uh, you know, after uh, uh, Stephen made his masterful account, uh, we're told that uh, he was stoned and Saul was watching over the coats of all of that. But you could tell uh, that uh, Saul's conscience uh, was pricked by all of that. He, he was cut through to the heart by all of this. And so uh, Jesus told Saul to go into Damascus. There a man named Ananias would come and pray for him and tell him what he must do. Well, Ananias uh, was then visited by Jesus. And he says, a man named Saul is coming. Uh, I want you to come and pray for him to receive his sight, and I will show him how much things he must suffer for my sake. And I was like, whoa, 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 Lord, you don't know what this guy has done. I'm giving you the Scott Richard paraphrase here. Uh, but you can read about it, all about it in Acts chapter 9. And, uh, and Jesus says, no, go. He's my chosen instrument. And so Ananias said, all right, I'll go. And he prayed and said, uh, Brother Saul, receive your sight. We're told at that point, scales fall, fell from Saul's eyes, and he was able to see again. And the world was changed by all of that. Now, could you imagine what would have happened if Ananias had said, there's no way that awful Saul, I know people that, you know, he's probably orchestrated their deaths and, you know, talk about a, a, an opportunity for righteous indignation. Mm-hmm. But, you know, uh, later on, uh, writing in the book of First Timothy, uh, this same individual who was Saul, the persecutor of the church, who became the apostle Paul, said this in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12. He says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man. But I obtained mercy 
because I did so ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. (laughs) I love the way he didn't say, I used to be, but now I'm happy all the day. I am chief. He says, but for this reason, I also obtained mercy that in me first, Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Craig, I, I get it. You know, when you see people just saying incredibly brutal and blasphemous things, when you see the stuff they've uh, vandalized the uh, Crisis Pregnancy Center with the slogans and where is your God now and all of this, it's easy for us to react. Hmm. It's easy for us, in a sense, to righteously react because, again, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people, we're told in the book of Proverbs. And, and I get it, and I understand that. But... You know, I think the Lord is looking for us to have that Ananias perspective. We never know who the next person is who's going to be the Rabbi Saul, who might be saying some awful, nasty, and terrible things, even engaging in acts of violence against people who name the name of Christ, Mm -hmm. who God is going to reach and touch and turn around and use like he did the Apostle Paul. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've seen some beautiful testimonies uh, online today. Uh, One uh, lady in particular uh, posted on uh, Twitter that uh, three years ago she was adamantly pro-abortion she was adamantly anti-Christian she absolutely hated those who were pro-life and pro-choice and and born-again believers but a year ago she gave her life to Jesus Mm. and she says look at the difference God has made in my life now so uh, you know Craig I get uh, that where you're coming from I understand uh, how it would be easy to uh, try to, you know, put out fire with kerosene in a sense. Mm-hmm. But God, I think, calls us to rise above that. I love the last line of the book of Romans chapter 12. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Mm-hmm. Uh, the more we can love people, stand by, you know, for, for our principles, obviously, in real practical and personal ways, you know, Get on the, the, the donation team for these ministries, at the very least. Volunteer time for them uh, and, and uh, minister with them if you can. If the Lord's laying that on your heart, for sure. But let's not let non-believers set our agenda. The minute we mm-hmm. get into reactivity against non-believers and, you know, again, how provocative sometimes they can be, especially online, well, they've won the battle. Mm-hmm. You know, we need to rise above that. We need to stand by our guns. We don't soft pedal the truth or just say well I mean, he's got an opinion uh but uh, on the other side of the coin uh we are to speak the truth in love and let people see the difference that jesus makes within our life i, I love that line from the book of revelation chapter 12 that talks about those who are going to lay down their lives for their faith in uh, even the great tribulation period it says mm. they overcame satan uh because they did not love their lives to the death mm. and they overcame by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony mm. Uh, the word of our testimony is a very powerful thing. And the more people are going to be going bonzo and crazy and riots in the streets or something, I'm praying that doesn't happen. Mm. But the more that sort of stuff comes on, the more we can, by contrast, say, well, yeah, you know, we're, we're very passionate about what we believe, but our passion is focused on loving people and making a difference in the lives of people. Right. You know, why do you have a problem with that? Yeah. Because so. emotions aren't, I mean, I've had to learn this in my life too. Emotions aren't bad. You know, even anger, anger is is a good emotion that, that shows us when there's something that's, there's an injustice, something that isn't right. We get angry and that's okay. So often it's not the emotion, it's what we do with the emotion where the sin comes in. That's why the word says, in your anger, do not sin. It's not being angry that's the sin itself, it's what we do with those right. <laughs> those emotions. And that's why love is patient, you know, being quick to hear, slow to speak, because as humans, sometimes we need time when we become angry or any other emotion, you know, aroused or whatever it is, we need a moment to be slow and to think, yes. and to process these emotions and seek the Lord for what to do with those emotions. And I've been angry over things and, and walked away with that anger and, and spent days or maybe weeks and realized I had no right to be angry. 
you know, I, hadn't, I, <laughs> I came to that conclusion. I don't have a right to be angry over this. That was my own pride or selfishness. And then sometimes I've come to the conclusion, yeah, there's, there's a reason there was an injustice and I've, you know, sought that person out or whatever the circumstance may be. So, um, so being angry itself is not a sin, but what we do with it, that's where, the, you know, that's where yeah. we can uh, stumble into those things. Um, so being, you know, quick-tempered is, is where we can get in trouble. But yeah. 